This is Norman Sylvester. And I'm Jeff Dodge. You're watching Tales, Tales of Old Portland. We're here to examine the hardships and struggles of those that came before us, particularly the African American experience in North and Northeast Portland. In this episode, we're looking at coming to Portland, all about the journey. You're watching Tales of Old Portland, Episode 1. Coming to Portland. Named after a coin toss between Francis Pettigrove and Asa Lovejoy, Portland, Oregon was almost called Boston. Instead, Mr. Pettigrove's hometown in Maine would become the namesake of Oregon's most populous town. In the late fall of 1805, the Lewis and Clark expedition and their Corps of Discovery would unwittingly pass the future site of what would become Portland. Traveling the Columbia River in search of the Pacific Ocean, they had recruited the services of French-Canadian fur trapper Toussaint Charbonneau and his Shoshone wife, Sacachewea, as translators for their journey. Also with them was William Clark's boyhood companion, servant and slave, York. In October of 1805, the Corps met their first Chinookan-speaking peoples on the Lower Columbia. York proved indispensable upon the return trip, serving as an emissary to the various tribal nations and in many instances negotiating the expedition's very survival. cultures over the years. Right, right, right. You know, and that's right. the problem. That's that's progress. I mean, when we talk about mm -hmm. the Africans being brought over for slaves, mm -hmm. displacement mm -hmm. for progress mm -hmm. in the South, the textiles and sure, sugar cane sure. to be farmed in that whole sad right. time. Sure. The plains uh -huh. over mm -hmm. across the great plains of this country mm -hmm. when uh, Native Americans were displaced for the railroad and the industrialization right. of that Absolutely. displacement, you know. Right. So, but it all started on the shores of Africa. People just minding their own business, playing drums, living godly, strong lives. Indeed, 
the seeds of the blues and gospel music came from the drums of Africa, but they germinated in the cotton fields of the Mississippi Delta. For survival in the fields, the slaves tap into that innate rhythm within them. And they used it to survive with the work, the rhythm of picking cotton, because I picked cotton when I was on the farm. And they didn't just go. <laughs> they had a rhythm because they had all day. They were looking at a road that was about a block long. And when they got down to that turn road, they had to come down the other side. So they were doing it like so. So everything they did was with rhythm. And that, that inner rhythm, that inspiration of just the godly beats, kept them strong and helped them survive. Got it. Got it. Well, it was because of cotton. It was because of cotton. It was because cause prior to the cotton boom, um, slavery wasn't uh, as economically feasible as other labor systems in a lot of places. It didn't die out in the North due to any sort of humanitarianism. It died out in the North because it wasn't economically, uh, fe you know, it didn't make it economic sense any anymore. Uh, but with the you know, the advent of the, cotton, of the cotton gin and cotton production throughout the South and slavery. Virginia. My grandfather belonged to Thomas Jefferson. My grandfather was 115 years old when he died. And now I am 101 years old. A lot of people didn't have no beds when they were slaves. You all slept on the floor. We were slaves. We belonged to people. They sell us like they sell horses and cows and hogs and all like that. Have an auction bench and they put you on, up on the bench and bid on you the same as you're bidding on cat, you know. You hear the whistle of a train heading north and you dream of getting away but you know you can't. And so you raise a song, and if only for that moment, transport yourself out of that field. And that's how the blues was born. He had been a cook on a naval expedition, was with the expedition for about a year and a half, went, uh, was present when they uh, discovered Antarctica, went to Australia, was involved in massacres. Then finally, uh, the ship he was in wrecked off of Astoria, and he and, and uh, 
two other black men deserted from the expedition at that point. The rest of the expedition got a new ship and they left and went on and finished up the expedition. You know, black people, you can trace black people being in the Northwest, uh, going back to, you know, Astoria and the Hudson Bay Company. So we're talking about over four, almost 400 years. So it's not like it was unusual to see a black person out here. There was a nobleman lived under the hill. Oh, daddy be gay. There was a nobleman lived under the hill. The thing to understand is how common it was for black men, free black men, uh, to work in the maritime industry. It was the number one employer of free black men in antebellum America. The lowest rung of society would, would have worked on a, a sailing ship, but it was the best job that a free black person could get. You know, if you look at so many narratives, Frederick Douglass, uh, uh, Harriet Jacobs, so many s narratives of slaves escaping to freedom, they usually pose as a sailor or they get, they disguise themselves as a sailor, they somehow get mixed in with the crew of a ship because the crews of these ships, of sailing ships at this time would have been 20-30% black. Mm -hmm. So if you read Moby Dick, you, you, that, that becomes very evident that these ships were multi-ethnic, multi multicultural. Well, in 1850, there were 54 African Americans in Oregon out of a population of 13,000 residents. Another 153 people were recorded as being Hawaiian or mixed Northwest tribal descent. Well, the Irish were already, with the potato famine, they were already coming in, particularly in the 1850s. There were a lot of Germans uh, coming in and they were all going to where the work was which was in the industrialized north. No one was going to go to the agrarian south. Why he deserted? He might have, I mean that that's a rough life and you know as he's getting older it was probably more difficult. He fell in love with uh, a, a Chinook woman uh, living probably on the other side of the northern side of the Columbia, the, the village. He just sort of disappears. He disappears from the historic record some, somewhere around 1851. Which isn't to say he died then, he just didn't show up. Uh, even more and more people were moving into Oregon. Being a black man working on the river uh, in the 1840s, he, he stood out like a sore thumb, but as Oregon was becoming more populated, and I think he probably went up north to Washington where things were a lot more uh, hospitable uh, to people of color than they were south of the, the southern side of the Columbia. John McLaughlin stories, yeah. Hard to separate the, the myth from the man. <laughs> we consider him more of a humanitarian person, a company man second, rather than uh, simply, you know, towing the, the company line from his superiors. Blacks who arrived during this period were denied the free land granted to white settlers through the 1850 Donation Land Act. The people who came to Oregon on the Oregon Trail were mostly from the Midwest. So they had, they had come from places most of which had had black exclusion laws at some point in their history. Most of those black exclusion laws were uh, against uh, runaway enslaved people. They were worried about runaways coming into their their communities. They were worried also that that slavery might be ended and there might be a, like a refugee mm -hmm. sort of situation of people coming in. The first black exclusion law is passed in 1844, partly inspired likely by uh, James Saul's Saul's got a group of Indians and, and allegedly threatened the life of this white settler with the got in an altercation uh, with a southern a settler named Charles E. Pickett who was from the deep south pro-slavery uh, settler he got in an altercation with him we're not quite sure why they were only uh, ever used once to exclude any specific person, which is Jacob Vanderpool, 
um, ran a hotel or a saloon and uh, he was forced to leave. They tried to force a man named Obi Francis to leave, but he had a lot of powerful friends and uh, they managed to get enough people in power to, to protect. But I think these laws were more symbolic. They had more symbolic power. And then after the 14th Amendment, you know, then the, you, these laws are un completely unconstitutional. They remain on Oregon's books symbolically, but they're unconstitutional. Black exclusion was in the Constitution until the 20s, and then I don't think it was removed entirely until the early 2000s. Like the actual language, some of the, la the final bits of language uh, to get it all uh, removed or re redacted. Here's what great many people do not know. That as a young man that way, I couldn't understand it fully. But I look back now and see my part in it. What we struggled for, and that was for state rights. And as that many of you know, immediately after the war, the rights of the various states well, especially in the South, were very much curtailed, if I may use that word. One of the reasons why the Civil War happened is the Three-Fifths Clause had ceased to do its job. It had ceased to preserve Southern power, and there, were, there was so much immigration in the North, and the birth rate was so much higher in the North that the North was politically overtaking the South, even with, even with the three-fifths clause, even with the way the Constitution had stacked things in favor of the South, it wasn't mattering anymore. The North was, the North could elect Lincoln, who wasn't even on the ballot in the South. The South was concerned about the political representation in the Congress, in the Senate. If there were too many free states, then, then a, the legislative branch would outlaw slavery. The Buffalo Soldiers were established by Congress as the first peacetime all-black regiment to serve in the regular U.S. Army. You know, that's the all that people say. All day long, we see them soldiers going back to silent homes, different places. Colored soldiers. Colored soldiers, they know. The nickname was given to the Black Cavalry by Native Americans who fought in the Indian Wars. The Buffalo Soldiers there. Very, very famous. Portland has a chapter. None of these gentlemen were Buffalo Soldiers because that was back in the early 18s, you know. And uh, but they want to keep the tradition going on. Uh, so these guys just volunteer. They buy their own horses or they rent a horse for that day. You know, as age goes, people get older. And now they have to recruit some youngsters, you know, to come along. And it's coming along to make sure that they keep this alive. One of the Buffalo soldiers um, that we had in our parade, like the Hall's Parade, was Jeff Parks, who used to own yeah. um, the World Esquire Club. Oh, yeah. Texas one, Texas two. We've got to mention him. He moved back to Texas, I believe, in a Carl Flipper. Yeah. Carl Flipper too. Right. Right. He was one at the late Carl Flipper. So you know, we just want to mention those. Yeah. Guys. Yeah, absolutely. The Civil War was fought over the expansion of slavery into the West. That would be my, my uh, if I had to go with one cause of that, it was the expansion. Because Lincoln would have been perfectly happy preserving slavery where it was, keeping it quarantined to the South. 
slavery started back in the 1600s, and it lasted up until Abraham Lincoln did a Bruno Mars. <laughs> Abraham said, stop! Wait a minute. Give me my quill pen. Put some in. I'm going to give these people salvation. I want to try the Emancipation Proclamation. So that happened in 1861, got ratified in 1862. Then the 13th Amendment came in 1865. Six million African-Americans just went everywhere. And the rest is history. After emancipation and the Civil War, African-American people found themselves in a strange position, freed without being free. The radical reconstruction period of 1867 would be met by fierce southern reactionary forces within a decade. These forces would reverse the gains by enacting Jim Crow laws and imploring vigilante justice throughout the former Confederacy. I'm the kid that's all a candy. I'm a Yankee doodle dandy. I'm glad I am. So don't Sam. I'm a real life Yankee doodle. Made my name and fame and boodle. Just like Mr. Doodle is by riding on a pony. I love to listen to the Dixie train. Hello, to see the girl I left behind me. Piano players like W.C. Handy and Scott Joplin, who they called uh, the king of ragtime, were important in the development of the blues because they traveled from town to town on the river boats and they were the first to write the blues down on paper. Their heavily syncopated approach to music got its name from the practice of some African-American pianists who developed a technique called ragging the classics. Dance was another key to the emotional and spiritual survival of African-American people. By the 1890s and early aughts, Dixie Jazz had gripped American culture and music, influenced, inspired, and created new forms of creative expression. From minstrel shows, vaudeville, to the hoofers like pork chop, one of the few probably career dancers to live in Louisiana. image behind me but 40 years ago I hitchhiked down to New Orleans and I met this gentleman dancing in the streets of the French Quarter. Uh, he actually looked like that in 1979 and I thought he was ancient but it turned out he uh, was in his, he was about 52. Anyway he was pretty gruff but he tolerated my presence because I got a bigger crowd with my long yellow hair. He got all the money. I got a lesson. Anyway, that's Pork Chop from New Orleans. Go back 100, 
almost 20 or 20 years, there were very few black people in Portland. I think in 1900, there may have been three or 400. And, even, and back then, they were actually just pretty integrated. They didn't care what black people lived. There were so few of them. I think 1896, a black man died, and um, about 500 people showed up to his funeral. Uh, the mayor and the, and, the, and the city council we had at the time showed up. The governor and a couple of senators showed up, and they were like, if you read the old Oregonian articles, it, was, it broke their heart that he died. But we didn't really get black racism, I mean, real racism on black people until uh, black people, like, like I tell people, start leaving uh, you know, uh, Jefferson County, which is where most black people lived in 1900, was in Jefferson County. When black people started migrating to the city, I'd say somewhere right around 1910, somebody woke up and goes, oh my God, there's, there's all these black folks here. You know, then we probably had, I don't know, two or 3,000. But about that time is when the first red line started hitting. By the 1890s, a small but tenacious African-American community began to form in Portland. While some took up residency in the Scandinavian town of Albina, many were laborers who came to work in the new transcontinental railroad yards. There was a lot of, lot of the families were railroad connected. Actually, my dad, when he came, he came to Portland um, as a result of being hired by the Union Pacific. Uh, as to be a doctor for the minority uh, workers. He came over here in 1929. We're fine in history, you know, because it's always been thought that he was the first black doctor, which is a real, that's a real fallacy. Uh, we're finding that uh, Dr. Merriman might have been, J.A. Merriman might have been the first doctor. Some information I got was like he was, came here like in the early, early hundreds, uh, 1900, early 1900. Since wise, he still, he was here up to the 1920 census. But uh, in doing some research, I found about two other doctors that were in, in Portland in that, that kind of the era between uh, the early 1900s. Before you did. Um, the Golden West Hotel was the center of Portland's African-American social and business life during the early 20th century. Established in 1906, it became the last refuge for many African-American travelers who had nowhere else in the state to stay. It would eventually close in 1931, a casualty of the Great Depression. That was a black-run hotel for the railroad. I mean, that would for, for the rail for the uh, you know the porters who would come in, into town would would stay there, and, and that was the that area around Old Town. That was the the original sort of black area. Uh, we had to live in Old Town uh, uh, downtown, then they moved up to Northwest Portland. Um, and then they, they, they didn't want us there, they moved us over to where the Memorial Coliseum is now. It was just due to segregation, you know, they would, that was the one area. They, they specifically said this is where you can live. They also let black people live in Southwest Portland, in, in a portion of the, of the, of the park blocks um, over there, in a portion. Corruption ran rampant in early 20th century Portland. Renowned for its brothels, Shanghai, and bribery, Vice reports estimated over 25% of the city's health infections were venereal, caused by the 400 houses of immoral repute within the city limits. There were retired pimps and hookers and what they called boot blacks, shoeshine boys, but at bartenders. At the time, that was self-employment entrepreneur. Because guys, that's what the, the black folks did in the old days. Back in the 50s, 40s, 30s, the black person was a distraction. That's what they called them, a distraction. They would usually get a visit, usually by one of the guys from the Pullman Porters and some other people, and they would be invited to leave, leave Portland, just go. And uh, if they didn't leave, then you know Tom Johnson, those guys, sent some other people over to visit them. And um, let's just say they've never been seen again. Perhaps a better example of Portland's racial paradox might be George Hardham, who was Portland's first African-American policeman in 1894. Or a number of black cowboys and other participants cheered annually at the Pendleton Roundups of the early 1900s. After the 1905 Lewis and Clark Centennial Exposition, Portland became a primary commercial hub for the Pacific Northwest. You know, it, it kind of reminds me, Portland reminds me of like the last frontier. 
you know, it was like a sleepy town, everybody, you know, I mean, you didn't know everybody, but, you know, everyone was friendly, right. you know, you'd walk down the street and you just, in passing, would just automatically say hi to people. Well, I mean, share mm -hmm. the migration that mm -hmm. you know, they came, they went to New York, mm -hmm. yeah. they went to California, mm -hmm. they went to Oregon, you mm -hmm. know, so they did share that migration, but they were right. coming this way. They were coming mm -hmm. this way, you absolutely. Know, because they figured the South was a good place to be from. Right, right. Yeah. While the Great Migration is largely thought to have taken place between 1916 to 1930, with Southern blacks seeking economic opportunity in the North, Many believe that a second migration took place after the Great Depression, bringing nearly five million people to the western states and their largest cities. International paper mill and all mm -hmm. these places mm -hmm. were laying off and people mm -hmm. would move, migrate this way to be with their families that have been out here Absolutely. a long time saying, the grass is greener, mm -hmm. come on out mm -hmm. here, you know, so, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. they came they mm -hmm. came out to the Northwest, which is right. a, a good right. commitment because you can come right. in 2,700 miles, 3,000 miles right. from home. Yeah. And, and a lot of those people had sure. never traveled. It's a mighty hard road that our poor hand has hold. And our poor feet has traveled a hot, dusty road. Out of the dust bowl and westward we rolled And your deserts are hot and your mountains are cold We travel with the wind and the rain in our face Our families migrating from place unto place We work in your beet fields till sundown tonight Travel 300 miles for the morning gets light Arizona, California, we'll make all your crops. Then it's northward to Oregon to gather your hops. Strawberries, cherries, and apples the best in that land full of promise at Pacific Northwest. New Orleans, Louisiana, D O Y L I N E. D O Y L I N E. I'm, uh, I was born 25. I'm so 92. 92 years old. Lula Johnson's farm in Bonita, Louisiana. We had the blessing of being born in the farmhouse, uh, back bedroom of my grandmother's home. No, Lula, it was at that time. We had a lot of local Louisiana people around. And, and that's where you're from originally? Yeah, originally, okay. yeah. Living in the South, in Picayune, Mississippi. My father was given information on jobs in Portland at the shipyard. So that's how we got here. Yeah, my grandfather came from New Albany, Mississippi to out here in June of 1935. He was a driver in Mississippi. He was a driver and he um, did chauffeuring and so that was his occupation. They married in uh, Omaha, Nebraska. They met in Kansas City. Missouri. My parents both are from Arkansas. My dad from Texarkana, Arkansas, and my mother from Forest City, Arkansas. Uh, Warren, Arkansas. I was born in Arkansas. I was born in Los Angeles, but uh, I was only there a few months. I came here from uh, Texas, uh, San Antonio, Texas. Joined the United States Air Force. Went to San Antonio, Texas. Then they sent me to the Fairchild Air Force Base in Spokane. Well, anything to get out of Arkansas would be better, you know, because it, it was rough down there. It was rough. No jobs for anyone. So I joined the United States Air Force just to get away. I was so young. I mean, uh, Portland is my home. So. Portland is my town. <laughs> With the depression of the 30s, the nation again looked hopefully to the northwest frontier, seeking opportunity in a still undeveloped country. It's a family affair. Although it brought us into the world in that back bedroom, in that little farmhouse, 
which wasn't small because most of the houses in Bonita, Louisiana were on the farm with shotgun houses, which when they say shotgun, that means that you can look through the front door and you look straight out the back door if the back door was open. And those, those houses just had a room, a room, a room, a room. But my mom's house had that plus. So it was a double shotgun. It was a double shotgun, double barrel shotgun house. Had a different kind of had a little stuff in it, like little chips and that's my point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get that up up on that red knoll by Mama Lou's always just white. It was beautiful, stuff. wasn't it? Beautiful. I could go up Mama Lou had the best. That was the most fertile ground. Yeah, there. I could not believe. I was it's loving the plow the land. When I plowed that ground, man, it, it felt like I was creating a masterpiece yeah. up there because where a house at? Yeah, you can see you see out there. It was a beautiful place. Grandmother, three sons, and one of the, of the grandsons, uh, Leander Johnson Jr. My dad moved here in 1957 to work out of the paper mill, and Bastard went down in employment to work at a place that Uncle John, who was John Henry Sylvester, which is my dad's brother. Did we get to train in Arkansas? Um, Collison. 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 And we came out here, and of course, most of the African American families that travel on the bus or train, um, their families would pack them a lunch, like a picnic basket. And we had food, but when we got to Denver, we were taken in by the uh, Union Pacific Porters, Pullman Porters, which is Porters, some of them waited on just the cars, but the Pullman cars was where all the rich people went to eat, and you know, steak and baked potatoes and onion soup. And they uh, found out we were Sylvester's, which they knew Uncle John and Dad. Mr. Cox, I remember Mr. Cox, who owned Cox Funeral Home here. He was a Pullman Porter. And they gave us food, remember? Yeah. And yeah, it took us back to the. Uh, they waited until everybody had kind of reclined and yeah. ate and laid back, back in their seats. And then they so, take us back and feed us. Yeah. So we came to Oregon, 57. Then Sheila was born. She was born we over and we lived, first we lived on North Monroe. Yeah. And we went from North Monroe to North Barthwick. Boys, again. Because we met some people here, Mr. and Mrs. Brady Rito. And they were New Orleans uh, yeah. Creole, Creole. Creole people. Yeah. And she had a small house. She told my mom, you can rent that house. 
And so we went there, it was very small. It was like a shotgun house. And that was the house where Daddy bought me my first guitar. Uh -huh. uh, in that house. I was in Boise School. Yeah, and I was at Jefferson. Yeah. I've been doing youth for a long time. Many, many years. Many, 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 many years. years. Yeah. Wonderful family. Right. So her, your maiden name is? Waters. Waters. Mm -hmm. Waters family. Right. What was your mom and pop's names? Uh, Ethel and George Waters. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. Yeah. Seven kids, man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Moving, yeah. running. So all seven kids were with you guys at Vanport? Uh, no, it was just uh, me because they came when they came up. Mm -hmm. They got the jobs in the uh, shipyard, mm -hmm. and I was the only one here. You were the only one. I was the only one born. Then the rest of them came along. After that. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, they did. The first house that's recorded was on uh, Northeast Benton or North Benton, okay. right where the Coliseum is in that area. Uh, his off dad's, dad's office and the house was all in one on, uh, in Benton, in the Tibbetts. And um, they were actually the first occupants of that house. Um, and uh, in 1930, about 32, 33, somewhere in there. My dad uh, came to Portland, I, I, I believe it was in uh, the late 40s, 48, 50, something like that. And uh, he acquired the property at the, on the corner of Williams and Beach. There was a multi-use building there and some apartments above it. And he had some retail commercial on the, on the main level. More like I almost remember the address. I think it was 3705 or 370, something like that. And, and uh, it was on the corner of Williams and Beach. And he had, he had the friendly barber shop in that building. Well, um, <laughs> uh, one of the things about the South, too, now, um, education-wise, mm -hmm. my sister came up at 12 years old from Mississippi. We went down, actually, and picked her up, my parents. And um, she uh, was a grade ahead of the children out here, all her classmates. Huh. They wanted to move her up. She was in the sixth grade, and uh, her teachers wanted to move her up, but my mom... Old school, yeah. wouldn't do it. When I came here in 57, 1957, um, I was seventh grade, mm -hmm. and I knew all my multiplication tables. Thank you. And I knew how Thank to write you. cursive and right, write print. Right, 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 um, right. Pretty avid reader, mm -hmm. and I was mm -hmm. ahead of uh, a all lot your of the, all your classmates. A lot of the yeah. classmates, a lot that's, of yeah, yeah, that's the way. There's a lot of scholars there already. Right. But mm -hmm. I was ahead of a lot of them. Right. From, because in the South, uh -huh. um, uh, they were determined to prepare you. Absolutely. For the t mm -hmm. tomorrow. That's right, and they didn't play. They yeah, were they very play. strict. No, very no. strict. No, well, they thank you. They, they <laughs> well, thank you. You, yeah, you got the public it schools, whipping. You got, you got yeah, it yeah, whipping. It, it was allowed. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. You didn't have to be a parochial mm -hmm. school to get a spanking down there. Mm -hmm. No. You know, uh -huh. if you didn't know what nine times nine yeah. was, you're gonna get a spanking. If she's told you that, you know. Mm -hmm. If you're supposed to know, right? You know, so you, you got spankers, and right. then you go home and you tell your parents about it. Oh, why they spank you? Mm -hmm. I didn't know this, I didn't know that. Well, let's just mm -hmm. work on that right now, mm -hmm. yeah, because you might get another one if you don't get that right. Now. So, what was the difference then moving from Oakland to here? A lot of difference, a lot of difference. A lot of difference. It was. Really, no comparison. Cause this is if I if I hadn't been married at the time, I'd have went back to Oakland. You know, Portland's changed a lot, uh, but even when Portland was at its worst, it was better than like my grandfather said, living anywhere in the South. Many other laws with regards to people of color, marriage, misogyny, were not changed until as late as 1953. You know, down south, the white people. It's not just they were racist. It was almost, it was like, he just had no rights. No, he didn't exist. Right. And my grandfather told me stories of uh, what black guys dress, dressing well and looking good, you know, and some white guy deciding, I want that. And just taking it. That's too good for you. So imagine a black guy like that coming to Portland. Yeah. And he, he's still dealing with racism. It's not like he, he has a freedom that the white people have. Totally. But still, we've, we, we got our, you know, got our issue. We've always approached racism a little different than other uh, places that was more tolerable, but it didn't make it fun, didn't make it easy. 
Well, you know, I got in some trouble down there in Cape Falls. Mm -hmm. What happened? I was calling my girlfriend back up here in Poland. Mm -hmm. And uh, this couple of white guys walked by and told me uh, I was on the phone out there. I didn't you want no phone like y'all got now, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, when I, uh, he told me, he said, get off this goddamn phone. He said, I looked at him, you know, mm -hmm. and they had a water sprinkler. Was sitting on the top of the years go around there. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said something. He went up at the grill, and then I grabbed a water, water sprinkler. I busted him. Mm -hmm. Busted him in the face, and was a white guy and his wife sitting over here like that. He said, Oh, he said, Come over here, boy. He said, Oh, this stuff down here. And my, my room wasn't too far up there. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like a motel, you mm -hmm. know. So I went on back to the deal lab, and it was a uh, it was a uh, right dude down there, and he worked with me mm -hmm. out there, you know. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he, uh, I uh, called him, he came on back up there. Because when they, uh, they kind of knew where I lived at, because mm -hmm. I had a 55 micro. Right. And what they did, they passed by there, and he had this towel up over his face where I had hit him at. Mm -hmm. And they said, I live there, you know. Mm -hmm. I said, oof. So what I did, I knew what this other guy lived at, and so I got in my work and I went on down there. Mm -hmm. Then I came back and I was talking about, about what happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, well, uh, he said, no, I got, I got a heat mm -hmm. He said, but, uh, well, you know. Yeah. I said, well, my dad always told me not to hang. Uh -huh. And so, <laughs> well, I forget the whole story, but I came on he followed me on back. Mm -hmm. He said, well, something happened. He gave me the gun. Mm -hmm. And uh, they hooked me up. I put my, uh, packed my stuff up. Get After the road. I'm gone. Yeah. You know. I know I've heard about the folks, uh, you know, some other people our age that moved into the North Portland and Northeast area, and <clears throat> they kind of were met with some um, problems. And I don't remember us having any problems in the neighborhood. I don't know if it was because the doctor moved in or <laughs> Either Elliot, Boise, or you know Holiday, or you know something like that, St. John's. We all lived in clusters. We went to Grand. I went to Irvington for four years when we moved in, and, and there might have been what three family, three friend. other black families. Yeah. Uh, and then when we got to Grant, there was by the time I got to Grant, there was when you were there, there was the um, there was about four families. Yeah. Four yeah. Four and by the time I graduated, uh, the the, uh, the migration of our African American um, uh, neighborhoods had increased. I tell people we didn't have our first black plumber until 1955. No black people did plumbing. Right. We didn't have our first black realtors until 1955. Mm -hmm. Period. We didn't have no black bankers at all until. Um, Mr. Booker uh, created American States Bank, I think in 60 or 61. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of jobs that black people have today that people, even white people are used to seeing black people having. Mm -hmm. Black people couldn't have. They didn't have. Just working out of town down in, uh, on the other side of Medford down there. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, I was the only black person going down there at work because this group of us went out there to work. And what were you doing? What were you there for? Uh, laying bricks. They was laying bricks and I was making the mud. You oh, know. Make mud, okay. Yeah. We went into the hotel and uh, there's two brothers and Lou and Gary, this mm -hmm. white, and just me and uh, this, um, our boss. Mm -hmm. We went in there and so uh, Ray went on in. They took him. He had his drinks. Mm -hmm. Then Lou would never go in front of me. Mm -hmm. Gary go on in, Lou will wait for Uncle, let me run on there. Mm -hmm. When he got there, I said, you can't, you can't go in there. So okay. we can't take him. Okay. Well, we we even went to Cave Falls. Yeah. Clamus mm -hmm. Falls. Uh -huh. And when they got down there. Same way. They told us, told the same thing, you mm -hmm. know. I eventually got into it down there. Uh, and, uh, of course, we after couldn't go into the, Hotel. Mm -hmm. We went. Uh, we went to. Uh, I forget the other places you go out there. You know that mm -hmm. uh, where they don't check you or nothing. You know, mm -hmm. and out there. But Ray went there and told him. Mm -hmm. Told this guy. He said, uh, "What? Uh, how come he can't go?" 
And he had gave his money. He told him, said, give me my money back. Oh, he took his money back. Yeah, he, had, he used words, you know. Oh, yeah. And he said, uh, you cut me right here and cut him right there. What, what color you think the blood going to be? There you go. Um, you know, back then there weren't very many opportunities for black people, you know, employment. You know, my grandfather lived on Northeast Fir uh, First and Broadway. My grandfather's name was um, George Golden. They called him Goldie. And his first job out here was at the Portland Hotel. He was at what he called the boot black. When you hear that, it's an old phrase for shoe shiner. Shoe shiner. And uh, my grandfather was, was just flat blown away. One, at the just sheer wealth of everything. He couldn't believe how wealthy the black folks were compared to like where he was from. Yeah, yeah. He worked there two weeks. Shiny shoes, got a, a, a dime a shine, right? Just a dime. Is he said, Fred? I worked my ass off those two weeks, and I made about five to seven bucks each week. He said, You don't understand. Back then, twenty-one year old man, five bucks in his pocket. Wow. You know, per week. I mean, five to seven bucks. I felt I was rich. You know, I was like, I can't believe these white folks are letting this happen. You know, he, he said, I put my money in my shoe because I just knew some white person was going to say, hey, that Negro's got some cash on him. We're going to have to take it, you know? So he always put his, his uh, money, he says, in his shoe so that when they put their hands in it, and he says, but no white people ever put their hands in my pocket. How old his brother got here in 53, 51? Not 51, he got here in 51. And then uh, I had uh, another brother that moved here in 55. Trying to better in better condition, better himself. Did better job. I worked at the Imperial Hotel. It was the Imperial then. I I heard you mention Euro's name earlier, but I mm -hmm. I, I trained Euro. At the Imperial? Yeah. Yeah. When, when I, I was working there when Euro started. I met you in 19, I was working at the Mono Hotel, and I came over to the Sheridan, and all your brothers were working yeah. over there. Yeah. So 1965. Yeah, 1965. Yeah. Joe's family, uh, his brothers, they worked at the Sheridan. A lot, and during that time, there was a lot of service jobs in hotels, like mm -hmm. uh, the gentleman was talking about the other day, the Imperial Hotel, yeah. the Benson, the Monoma, yeah. the Sheridan. Yeah. Make good money, kids. That's, that's right. That's where I got started at, at the Sheridan. I worked at the Mallory and the... Uh, Imperial? Imperial. Yeah. Because the, the, they were owned by the same corporations. I worked at the Monoma Hotel, which was the sister hotel to the Benson. And so they decided to say, well, they were going to take one of those hotels out of business. And they decided the Benson was centrally located, so they sacrificed the Monoma, which ends up to be what we call the Embassy Suites right now. Um, Theodore Roosevelt stayed at the Monoma Hotel back in the day. That was their big history. Teddy. Yeah, Teddy. Yeah. I started working working there when I was probably like 14, 15 years old. Yeah. Well, see, in those days, um, uh, waiters dressed dapperly, you know, they, they dressed up. They was running with big trays of chalice, chrome color. Ten. How many ten? Ten dinners on a plate. Ten on a tray. tray. On a tray. And they was running with them. And I don't, you know, I can't even make my hand go back that flat. <laughs> and they would come down to this table and they just roll it around and sit it down on this little deal and then serve the tables. Wow. And then go back and get another. That was back in the day when we had a lot of social clubs in North Northeast Portland, the Oklahoma Club, the Texas Club. Yeah, that was the Esquire uh, and it. And it. Yeah. Because the Louisiana Social Club gave a lot of parties up there, a lot of gumbo, chicken yeah. fried, fish fried. That was during the time of the social clubs, mm -hmm. like the Oklahoma mm -hmm. Club, mm -hmm. Texas Club. Mm -hmm. The Louisiana Club, the Texas Club, and Arkansas. the Oklahoma Club. Arkansas Club. Arkansas Club. Arkansas Club. Yeah. 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 Okay. So okay. every uh, uh, state that moved here from the South, at least four of them had a social club. Had a social club. Mm -hmm. oh, remember the Arkansas Club? Mm -hmm. and we played the, uh, yeah, we played the Colton Cade Ball. Mm -hmm. for, for yeah. six, we played all of those events, but uh, the money wasn't flowing that big in mm -hmm. those days, man. Well, you know, when they had the dances downtown there. And then when those clubs broke up, they fused together, then it was the LTO Club, the Louisiana-Texas-Oklahoma Club. <laughs> <laughs>
And we had the Jackie Gills, which is Jackie. the oldest, which is the oldest yeah. of the clubs, I think. Because mm -hmm. uh, when I moved here in 58 from Oakland, California, the Jack and Jill's was something real strong. Mm -hmm. Oldest social club that was here when I come here. Okay. Yeah, they, uh, they gave dances every year. They gave dances, spring dances, and Christmas formals, and we get to play for those. <laughs> they kind of messed them together. Yeah, yeah, well, it, the uh, people started dropping out. And then so sort it of got real small, so they just uh, try to combine them together. Yeah, they got they got together uh, and played dominoes, big whist, and tongue and Tom, all those old yeah. games, card games, card games, yeah. Card games, yeah. yeah. Big head so hard. 